Good morning, and welcome to the United Church of Christ of Annapolis Worship Service. I'm Kathy McFadden, the moderator, and I hope you're all staying well and safe. Yesterday, I was able to give a gift of laughter, open space on our beach, and have time with some of our friends. This was critical for the husband because he's a nurse at the ICA ICU unit in Baltimore. He works the night shift, and his patients are the worst of COVID-19. He shared with me his daily routine, both at the hospital and when he arrives home every morning. During our prayers, please keep LJ and his family health and safe. They are under, under tremendous stress every day for our people that are suffering the worst. I have a few announcements this morning. Um, every Sunday before um, church, you can join the Bible study at 9 a.m. on Zoom. Uh, make sure that you all come to coffee hour immediately after the service. It's so wonderful to see so many of our members join for 30 minutes and we get to talk and go in and out of different groups. It really keeps us connected with each other. Um, Evolve is tonight at 6 p.m., so you can find the link in the bulletin. And then our online gatherings, um, uh, services or online gathering uh, during the week is um, I'm living the question. And please note that it's being moved to Thursday instead of Wednesday uh, this week at 10.30 a.m. And if you would like um, to be a part of that discussion, we'd love to have you. Also, if, you, if you're a parents that would like to ha have your children uh, talk with pastor uh, by appointment only, um, if you can reach out with him for a conversation, uh, send him an email at pastor.uccaannapolis.org and they'll find a time to meet with your children. 
Also, Pastor Ryan's office hours are 10 a.m., 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. On, on Tuesday mornings. Also join us with the UCCA social hour. Please be safe, please be healthy, and please keep all of us in your prayers as we go through this really unprecedented time. Have a great day. This is the call to worship and bringing in of the light. I even lit a candle today. Um, the grace and peace of Christ be with you. My name is Hildi Cardacci, and it's my joy to worship with you, church, on this day. The service order has been posted on Facebook and emailed out. Please feel free to download it from there and let us all join together in our call for worship. God, have you forgotten me? How long will your face be hidden from me? I am shaken for what I thought I once knew, what I thought was a firm foundation, it has been cracked open. Within me and all around me, there is turmoil. Remind me that your steadfast love has never gone away. It is rooted in justice, in hope for your people. If I seek your love and reorder my life around it, I will recall that you have never forgotten me and have surrounded me with love. Open my eyes. That, that I may see my sisters and brothers and you in them. Open my ears. That I may listen. And my lips. So my mouth may proclaim your praise. Peace be with you. And also with you. Share a sign of peace by commenting. <laughs> Shout peace to the world.
Please pray with me. God, draw near to us so we may draw near to you. For so long we have been apart, but in and through you, we're never apart. The body of Christ continues to do ministry in this time, in this place, called by you. We are never forgotten. So bless us as we worship wherever and whenever we are to heed your call and be a people of love. Amen. Amen. And people of God, trusting in God's forgiveness, let us in silence confess our failings and acknowledge our part in the pain of the world. Before God, and with you, the people of God, I confess to turning away from God in the ways I wound my life, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Before God and with the people of God, we confess to turning away from God in the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. May God forgive you, Christ renew you, and the Spirit enable you to grow in love. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace be with you, and welcome to our children's message today. I'm going to share a story about a science experiment that went horribly wrong. I was 14, and I thought that I was really, really good at science, or pretty much anything I turned my hands to. And as sometimes happens, there's a science experiment that we're supposed to do, and so it's one of those you know big projects. And so I had decided that I wanted to show the power of water to make hydroelectric electricity. Now, I've been fascinated by this since I was a young child. Um, going, I would go up to Michigan in the summers and there's this big old hydroelectric dam um, right there on the St. Mary's River in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. And I always thought that was the most amazing thing. So I wanted to demonstrate how powerful this was to a bunch of Floridians, because we really don't have hydroelectric uh, dams in Florida. And so I came up with this idea of how to create this, and I put it out very meticulously, drew all the plans, but I, I never quite figured out if it was going to work or not. And so what I did was I was using this styrofoam to create this dam, this model, and I modeled it out of styrofoam, but I put it in a plastic bucket. And I used caulk to hold the styrofoam together with the, with the bucket. And I, I was you know, working on it, and I'll say I procrastinated just a little bit, but not too much. I, you know, it's just a little bit. Worked hard on this thing, got everything together. I had all of, the, all of the calculations done. I was ready to go. But the day before it was due, I realized maybe I should test this just in case something's wrong. And remember how I said I used caulk to put the styrofoam on the plastic? Well, the one problem is that as much as I researched hydroelectric electricity, I didn't research that caulk and styrofoam and plastic don't actually really hold things. And so I had created little, you know, cityscapes and trees and all this stuff. And so I, I took this bucket of water and I walk up to my model that I've spent all this time trying to build. And I pour it into the back of this thing and it fills up. I will watch the little paddle that I designed in the middle start turning, which is supposed to demonstrate the power of water. And so it starts to turn, and then the dam broke. The caulk didn't hold. Boom. I had a muddy, 
plastic tree filled mess on my hands and the project was to be brought in the next morning. So I cried, I got really upset and started to rebuild it. I didn't change how I had rebuilt it. So the next day when I modeled it for the class, it did the exact same thing. <laughs> we demonstrated the power of natural disaster or man-made natural disaster. Somehow I miraculously got a C on, the, on it. I guess the calculations were there. But because I had never been willing to risk finding out if it worked or not until the very last minute, I never knew if it would work or not. I had all the ideas, but I never trialed it. And a lot of times we're asked to, to do things really hard, but it takes a lot of practice and a lot of effort and a lot of energy, and we have to try it. If we want to play baseball, we have to practice it a lot. And we have to actually go out and run the risk of getting hit by a baseball. If we want to learn how to play soccer, same thing. If we want to learn how to do mathematics really well or become an engineer, we have to test and trial these things. We have to test ourselves. So it can be really, really hard sometimes because we may work really hard at building something, say, building something out of Legos. And I know my son Floyd enjoys that a lot. But we won't know if it's going to hold up until we test it. And sometimes we might be afraid to test it because we're worried it will disprove what we thought we needed to do. But if we go ahead and try to test it anyway, if we take that moment and try, well, then I think we find that it's well worth the time and the effort because then we can rebuild it, go back and try again. Just because my experiment failed doesn't mean that hydroelectricity doesn't work. It does work. I just didn't test it because I was afraid it wouldn't work. And once I did test it, well, my fears were proved true. But if I tried earlier, maybe I could have fixed it. And if we try and we keep risking and we keep trying, maybe, just maybe, we'll get better at what we're doing. And Jesus shows us a lot about that in the scriptures, about going and trying to talk to neighbors and friends and doesn't always get it right, but often it winds up working out well for everybody. Let us pray. Loving God, help us to have the courage to try, to test, to really allow ourselves to experiment, but also have our work be broken. Because in this way, we will know that we can try again and do better on the next try. And so let us pray the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jim, you're muted. Oh, look at that picture. This is so cool. This is the baby. This is the newborn baby, Catalina Ivy. All right, Jim. Thank you. Well, Paul, uh, unfortunately, I can't show you me because my video doesn't work very well on my computer. But this is Jim now, your treasurer, coming to you from an undisclosed location in my basement office bunker. Uh, oops. I guess I just disclosed my location. Oh, well, as Ryan said, Cindy and I are new grandparents and certainly that is not me or Cindy. 
but that is Catalina Ivy we're so proud of. So welcome everyone. At the Board of Trustees meeting, we discussed the work we have been able to do as a church. The trustees and Ryan all agreed that this information should be communicated, but you know, who should do that? Well, you guessed it and here I am. While the pandemic has stopped us from being able to meet together, it hasn't stopped us as a church and as a church community. So let me run what I know, which are numbers, which I hope you'll find as impressive as we all did. Our pledge activity has actually gone up for both April and May. In April, we had pledge collections of $14,826, which is 105% more of what we expected for the month. In April, we received a lump sum pledge of $9,500 for the year. And that allowed us to use those funds to create the Deacon Relief Fund in the amount of $15,000. So we have monies available to be able to help members of our church uh, that may be struggling through these difficult times. In April, we had unpledged collections totaling $6,465, which was 242% over what we expected for the month. So that was some amazing statistics, <clears throat> but it didn't stop in April. In May, our pledges totaled $15,301, or 108% over what we expected for the month. And now our year to date through May collections is $76,287 or 45% of our $170,000 projected annual goal. On pledge collections for the month was 2,690, 101% over what we expected. And our year to date collections for on pledged is $17,025 or 53% of our $32,000 goal, something we can all be proud of, which helps us be able to do so much of what we've been able to do these last few months. Been committed to protecting our staff and, and embarked on a program to keep them on the payroll through this pandemic. And then in April, we were able to complete an application for under the CARES Act in the amount of $47,245. This allowed us to pay both the church and Cornerstone staff wages for April and May. So we spent all these funds now. Uh, and so that has been taken care of and been able to support both our staff at the church. It includes our nursery staff, as well as the Cornerstone counselors and allowed us to make some other allowable expenses without having to use the money coming from pledges. And we're now in the process of completing an application to convert this loan to a grant, which we feel are very hopeful that that will in fact occur. With our continued pledges, we will continue to support the payroll for our church staff, and that is important to us. A benefit of the CARES Act was it allowed us to forego payment from ACT in May for their contribution to Pastor Ryan's salary. By saving them ACT that money, it gave, allowed us to give them even more support in these difficult times. In April, the council committed to supporting our greater community. And the council agreed to donate 10% of the total pledge and odd pledge collections to feed Anne Arundel for the months of April and May. Well, missions threw in $750 to that donation out of their own pot. We received a large $2,000 donation, $2, donation from another member in our congregation. And our April tithe was $2,129. And our May tithe was $1,799. Which means that for these past two months, we have been able to support Feed Anne Arundel with total donations totaling $6,678. This is all because of the donations and the pledges that we've been able to receive and the support we received through the CARES Act loan that we obtained. We are a church committed to each other and to our community. Know that we are doing good work. Thank you. Thank you. 
and congratulations on that beautiful child. Thank you. Listen now in the reading of scripture for the word and wisdom of God. We open our hearts to the word and wisdom of God. The reading this week is from Genesis 22, verses 1 to 14 from the New Revised Standard Version. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, this is God, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering in one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set it out and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, you stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, father, and he said, here I am, my son. And Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on your boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thickets of, by its horns. Abraham had went, took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. LD, thank you for reading that challenging text. Church, our gospel reading today comes from the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of them will lose their reward. For the word of God in scripture, for, for the, the word, word of God, God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God.
Please pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So church, I am joining you from our building today. Um, this is the first time I've actually been behind the pulpit, in this pulpit anyway, in almost four months. It's an unusual feeling to be here surrounded by equipment with a speaker and a computer with a camera, a phone, a, a music stand so that the words aren't that far away from me. It's an unusual feeling, but I do miss you being here. Also, I'll make the choir a little bit envious. It does feel good to sing in a building like this one. But today we have a story of welcome, but also a really challenging story about Abraham and Isaac. And it's a story that gave me pause as we were looking at the different scripture options that come up in our revised common lectionary. But I felt like it was important to nonetheless share this story and to hear what God is bringing to us in this moment. But we start instead today with a story from 1549. In 1549, a visitor came to Michelangelo's studio in the pedestrian part of Rome, the Machel di Corvi, or Crow's Market. Today, the largest insurer in Italy has its headquarters atop where this studio had been, and it was built in the early 20th century under Mussolini as he modernized Rome with clean corners and rigid angles, control and power. But in 1549, it was loud, it was messy, it was dreary, it was kind of an uninspiring corner of the eternal city. Yet this workshop was improbably filled with Michelangelo's work in various stages of completion. One could see and walk in and see figures from biblical stories emerging from out of hard quarried stone and marble and begin to imagine those figures coming to life and singing in that very place. On the day of this visit, when the visitor came there, Michelangelo, though, wasn't finishing off a sculpture. Instead, the guest described how he broke up, destroyed, a version of the Pietà of Madonna, which he was not happy with. And here's what the visitor wrote. I have seen Michelangelo, although more than 60 years old, in fact, he was 74 at this time, and no longer among the most robust knock off more chips of a very hard marble in a quarter of an hour than three young stone carvers could have done in three or four. An almost incredible thing to one who has not seen it. And I thought the whole work would fall to pieces because he moved with such impetuosity and fury, knocking to the floor large chunks, three and four fingers thick. Imagine the ability to destroy something so rapidly out of something as solid as marble because it no longer served its purpose. It had not come out right. The American author Edward Dahlberg, who penned the first major anti-Nazi novel in 1934 after covering Nazi Germany for the New York Times, once said, think how much one can learn from what is unfinished or has flaws provided the hand is Michelangelo's or Melville's or Whitman's. Yet the pieces were broken up rapidly, perhaps horrifyingly, as the Virgin Mary and her child, Jesus, were turned into dust. Even Michelangelo's own image was part of that attack because he had used his image in the face of Nicodemus, who was in this same Pietà, and the Pietà was destined to be, or uh, destined to go over the top of his own tomb. But he tore his own face apart. He tore his own work apart. He tore this story apart that was coming, and he did it quickly. But he also did it masterfully. Destruction was not random. He was taking it apart in a way that would allow it to be put back together again at a later date. And his student, Tiberio Cal Calcagni, was able to piece them back to together in a way that was more fitting with what the story was supposed to tell. 
That being said, I still cannot imagine tearing apart a work of art such as that. I would side with Dahlberg in thinking that even with the flaws, this is Michelangelo, this is beautiful, this is gorgeous, it's got to be amazing just to be able to experience that. Why would one tear that apart? After all, what Michelangelo did was not just see the form of images locked in stones formed over millions of years of gravity and pressure and stardust coming together and forming. No, what he did was he took space, spaces such as this, spaces for worship, and he found a way to make them welcoming, to bring somebody in to participate in the story of God, the story of scripture, to bring alive something that was fixed in its place so that one could interact with it, to be fully welcomed as oneself, not just be forced upon. That was the beauty of the work that Michelangelo was doing as an architect, as an artist, as a sculpture, was creating welcome through art. It's a challenge, but it's what makes it not just technically aesthetic, but welcoming, invitational, inviting. We know that I don't like to tear things apart because I just shared that story with our, with our, in our children's message about how even though I was pretty sure it wouldn't work, I didn't want to tear it apart and redeal it because I'd already done most of the work. But this, the project didn't work and therefore probably needed to be torn apart. It had a flaw. It had a major design flaw that came right from its very beginning. And we in this church and in this country we probably have a design, we have a design flaw as well. Not probably, we do. Some of it's slavery. Some of it's how we've treated women. Some of it's how we've used money and capital. How we've, how we've talked with one another. Slavery precedes our national founding and yet to my horror as a child of the American South, it was a long time before I learned how large a role slavery played in the drafting of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and constitutional law going forward. It has bruised and rendered hypocritical our calls for global justice and clouded, especially now, our own security in the markets and systems that have upheld American values by reminding us that so many of those values were bought at the crack of a whip on black bodies that were treated as property not human beings or children of God. To be welcomed is to be invited as one is into a space or place or time and for one's own interaction with the space to be valid. I don't know why Michelangelo broke the Pieta in 1549 but I suspect that the flaw, though even able to be examined for its beauty, was that it still felt like stone rather than life. It failed to welcome. Jesus' word in the gospel are short. It's one of the shorter readings that we've had. And I feel sorry for our liturgists because for the past couple of weeks, I've been handing y'all a couple pages of readings. This one was no exception. But even for their shortness, they're especially powerful. They might even seem overly simple. If you welcome a prophet, you get a prophet's welcome. If you get, welcome the righteous person, you get the righteous person's welcome. And then he goes into this part where he talks about even giving a cup of water to one of these little ones is welcome. It seems so simple so basic, so fundamental that why would it be in there? We as a congregation say we want to practice welcome. We have it printed there, right there on the entryway to the church, extravagant welcome. We talk about welcome. I, we talk about welcome, but we also practice it. I know that in the time before COVID, a hug from Elizabeth was there. And she would risk her health to do it to make sure that people felt a welcome into a space. The welcome was characterized by all the different ways that we thought about it as our, as our liturgists and our 
greeters and our ushers were becoming more and more professionalized or trained, the first thing that we were asked to do was to walk out of our car again, or go back to our car, walk up to the church, and think about how does this look welcoming to us? Is this space welcoming? Does it, is it aesthetically welcoming? Does it look cared for? Does it look open? Does it look friendly? Or is there something about it that just isn't quite? And that led us to do all sorts of work on the very act, the very process of trying to welcome. But I think what holds all of us back when we think about welcome is something a little more pernicious. Because I think when we tend to think in terms of welcome, we frame it in proprietary terms. That is, that we are called to welcome people into something that is ours. And we tend to think in terms of the fact that when we're welcoming somebody into our home or into our car or into our space, that we have some ownership of that space. And having that ownership of the space means that we have certain customs and norms and expectations that we wish for people to follow in order to receive the cold glass of water. In other words, because it's proprietary, it becomes conditional. Now, a business may welcome its customers, but also, you know, have you ever seen the no shirt, no shoes, no service sign? There's a condition to the welcome. A, a person may say, you're welcome to come into my home, but please don't do this or this or this. You are welcome into the space, but don't do this, this, and this. In fact, it's a normal thing to do. I spent much of my Navy career as a protocol officer working in diplomacy. My job, my, my, the very job that I did was very focused on how to adapt and how to teach somebody to adapt their behavior to a certain place in a certain time in a certain way so that they wouldn't be offensive, so they could come into this cultural space and be able to participate in the diplomatic work that we, we were at without stumbling over the cultural sensitivities that we were supposed to know. Sounds reasonable, and it should be reasonable. But, and that was my work with the Navy, I was good at that, but one thing that made I learned in that job was that when you didn't know anything, or you weren't exactly sure what you were going to do, think through what was the most reasonable thing, and then do it with confidence. Pretty much any time you felt like you knew what you were doing, or it looked like you knew what you were doing, and at least were respectful, people were more than happy to welcome you in. But there's a big gaping problem with this proprietary approach when one happens to be a church. We are not our own. Yes, technically, there is a legal structure that we own. Yes, technically, there is a whole corporate system and a set of bylaws and all of those things in place. Of course there is. That's part of the accountability that we have to the world and to our neighbors. But spiritually, we belong to God. And everything that we have in old church cornerstones, you used to see it, to the glory of God, we erect this church. The church belongs to God, not to us. The proprietary welcome isn't us. It's God. And at that point, we cease to be the ones who own the space, but rather are called to be servants of God, who, when we think in terms of welcome, not how do we welcome, but how does God welcome? In what way is God welcoming people into a place, into a space, into a ministry, into a community? How is God welcoming that? And is that different from how we're welcoming? Now, that is a daunting task because no one can know the mind of God. So we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out exactly what God is calling us to do in this place. And it's amazing how many different messages God puts in the brains of people when we sit around the table at a council meeting. But this is exactly what it means to work out the mind of Christ. We are called to seek the mind of Christ in a time and in a place when it comes to terms of welcome. But like our country... We are, in the, we are the inheritors of a horrible legacy. There is a terrible reason that 11 o'clock on the Sunday is still the most segregated hour of the week in the United States of America. We 
continue to think in terms of black church and white church, Latin church and denominationalism. We remain focused on the heritage we have received and prioritize it over God. We remain risk averse when it comes to even inviting people who are different than us into our church and they have reason to not trust our institution. Our shared history has justified servitude and has been underscored by generations of bone-crushing inequity. But are we willing to change that? It requires great sacrifice. It requires the ability to break apart even things of great beauty. And it requires the strength and the humility of a Michelangelo. We have to be willing to sacrifice things that we might hold most dear and precious. The story of Abraham and Isaac is not one that should be read out of the context of what's happening around it, but it often is. And let's be clear, many scholars have looked at this and said, this is divine child abuse. It's a hard, hard text. But it's entwined, Abraham's story is entwined with a desire for he and his wife to have a child. Eventually that happened with the arrival of Isaac, but it had come long after they had given up any real hope that this would happen. And Isaac's birth was flawed. Abraham and Sarah had not trusted in God, and so they had violently taken the body of another woman, Hagar, and force that woman to have a child for Abraham so that that child would be able to carry on the legacy. They did not believe that God would provide it. But when Sarah improbably gave birth to a healthy, joyful, laughing child, whose very name means laughter, they cast out Hagar and her child, sending them with not nearly enough provisions into the desert into most likely certain death. Sure, that gave Abraham a heavy heart, but it was also a way to get rid of a mistake, the evidence that they no longer trusted God. So he left it up to God to sort out. They were ashamed of their lack of trust of God and jealous that their so-called mistake would take over all that they had planned. But God doesn't make mistakes. God promised, God provided for Hagar and for Ishmael. And it's Ishmael who we trace the beginning of Islam back to. He gave them promises that had been denied them by Abraham. But God tested Abraham. And it's a question of, do you really trust God? Do you really orient yourself towards what God is calling? And so we have this demand, this horrible demand, to take the child and treat it as a sacrificial lamb upon a fire in a burning pyre. I can't contemplate this. But I think that there is a challenge here. Abraham had not trusted God. And because Abraham had not trusted God, he had caused pain and suffering to another human being, to a mother and a child. And I don't believe that what God was asking here was to get rid of your child, although that's the challenge. What God is saying is, can you trust God so that the world may thrive? And so this horrible challenge comes out, and Abraham goes to do it. And pastors, long before me, have taken this text and treated it as the faithfulness of Abraham saw him through. And maybe that's true. But I believe what it did was it reminded Abraham that when we take the things that we value over what God is calling us, we take those things so much that we can't even imagine life without them. 
that we're unwilling to change the world, even when it's, we're finding out that it's causing harm to the world, if we're unable to do the work in the world that we're called to do, because the world has been messed, we have messed up the order of justice in this world, if we're unable to do the work that would change our church to become a place of welcome, of radical welcome, beyond what we're even willing to imagine, if we're able to have that prophetic vision, what are we willing to get rid of in order to make that happen? What are we willing to cast out in order to make that happen? What are we willing to do to be the disciples that follow God? Not blindly, but with an awareness of the world around us. For what is the first thing that happens here? The first thing that happens here once God is convinced that Abraham does prioritize God, does realize that Abraham has made mistakes, does understand this. God takes the child, do not lay a hand on this child, and points out the sacrificial ram. Now, for those who are worried about cruelty to animals, that is a different discussion. But the practice of the time was honored. Now, where does that leave us today? Well, I think we can learn from Edward Dahlberg, that American author, and his statement that we can learn from the flaws of Michelangelo or Melville or Whitman. We can learn from the mistakes that are out there. There is beauty in what we have created. There is beauty in what we have done. There is beauty in what we have brought together, but it also has a flaw. And that flaw keeps it from being the singing stone, the singing life, the invitational presence or place that we are called to be. So what we can do, what we should do, what we must do as Christians, is to perhaps begin to engage deeply with the work that we are called into, to read our scripture and study it deeply and with passion and with hope, but to also begin to examine ourselves in a conversation in relationship with people who are different and begin to do some work to say, maybe we should change this. Maybe we should try this. I don't want to do it, not at all. But if it changes the world, if it bends the arc of justice just a little bit cold, closer, if it ultimately really gives us hope instead of a security blanket, then maybe we should be doing that. Maybe that's what God is calling us into this moment because what we've got to realize is that for the past 400 years, we've gotten it wrong. And our churches are complicit in that. And we become risk averse. And we become places of just caretaking rather than places of radical welcome for the people of God. There is a time and there is a place, and of course Ecclesiastes words it well, where we absolutely must rest and be present. There is a time and there is a place where we need security and comfort. And we are called to be that place. But there is also a time and there is a place where we are called to tear down the walls of injustice that are within our hearts. We are told to risk what we think works in order for something that really, truly can work. We are called to change the world. We always have been from the very beginning. There is no point in the Bible where it has been said, yep, everything's good, it's okay. That lasted for all of half a chapter. We've always been called to be engaged in the world in a new and different way. So what can we do? Well, read scripture. Reach out to one another. Read some books on privilege. They're out there. There's a lot of them. And we'll send out more. Invite others to do it with you. Think creatively about how we can continue to build some power in the community to get some permanent changes through that are long, long, long overdue. What is our role in that? 
pray. Pray without ceasing. St. Paul saw the hope and the possibility of Christianity, and he tried to graft it into a culture that was wildly different than the one in which it was birthed. And so he prayed hard, and he worked hard to develop the relationships with people so they could see what God was calling them to do. We're still doing that work. It never stopped. We are the inheritors of that tradition of adapting this faith that's following a Jewish carpenter, the son of God that we say, to a culture that is wildly different from the one that he was in, and yet remarkably similar when it comes to control and domination. We are called to have that work of adaptation to, as H. Richard Niebuhr said, Niebuhr said to preach, uh, pastors, if you're going to preach, preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, to bring the relevance of these things together such that we are connected to the world around us. But fundamentally, we have to be willing to risk. Being prophetic cannot stop with just the words of prophecy. There's a lot of good wordsmiths out there. It has to be followed through with action. So what action do we take? And again, it starts with us developing those relationships, working on ourselves. And then, in a collective, following the old African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We figure out how we can go together to change the injustices that have been sunken into the very structures and fabrics of our own institutions, including this one, in the world. So church, God is with you. God has not forsaken us. God has not walked away from us or turned God's face away from us. God is in and around us constantly in ways that we don't even completely understand. We are called, as the people of God, to put aside our fears, to be willing to risk something, so that the world may be changed, that love may break forth, and that, the, and that God may be glorified. Thanks be to God. Amen. This is for the collection for the work of the church in the world. People of God, we know that every gift that we give comes from God. But they are often won through hard work, deferred gratification, and delayed opportunities. Our church is called to ministry, to care for one another and be a force of good for God to change the world. What you give today continues our mission and our ability to be a church for such a time as this. Thank you and thanks be to God for all your gifts and your giving. There is an online way to do this. Thank you.
Gracious and loving God, we are grateful for the opportunity to give, to be able to give of our time and our talent and our money. We're grateful that the team came in yesterday voluntarily to help remove some old trees from the space to make it more open and more welcoming, including creating a socially, physically distanced circle. We are grateful for all of the work that people put forward and for all of the money given in the service of this ministry. Thanks be to God. Amen. Friends, we now come to a time where we share our prayers with one another, and I invite you to write those prayers there in the chat on this YouTube feed so that uh, I can read them out if you're willing for that to be shared. We'll start each prayer. I'll say them, and then I'll ask us to say, God, in your grace, hear our prayers. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Or, as is so often the case, God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. We start today by recognizing that today is this two-year anniversary since the Capitol Gazette shootings in Annapolis. We remember the journalists who were killed. We remember the work that they did. We remember what it means to have freedom of speech. And we remember the fear and hatred of truth that led to those deaths. God, bless us as guardians of that work and all those who are upholding those five people in prayer. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Sandy offers up a prayer for her former pastor, Tommy Darm, as she continues her battle with ALS. She now does not have the ability to walk or to speak as this disease ravages her body, but her mind and spirit are sharp. Pastor Tommy, we pray for you, for your comfort, for your strength, and for all those around you who are caring and being there with you. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayer from Nathan offered up for Thanksgiving for the birth of their new nephew, Jonathan, on Tuesday. Nathan, we pray for you and this new child um, coming into the world for the hope that that brings, for the work that that also brings, for rest for the parents at some odd moments, snatched from wherever they can be, and for the child's continued health and joy. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. We pray, we offer a prayer from John uh, for, uh, for his son, Andy, as he seeks ans answers from the doctors on neuro neurological programs. John, we pray for you and your wife and your son and all those who care for him. And for those who are looking after him and, uh, and trying to investigate what is going on, God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. Prayer from Aaron to pray for... Um, her 37 neighbors at Bayshore Landing Apartments who have been displaced after this week's two-fire alarm. Aaron, we pray for you. We also pray for another um, adherent to this congregation who uh, was in, one, in the complex that was burned. Um, we pray for, for both of you, for all of the people displaced by this, um, and for all of the challenges that that brings. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Um, prayers of thanks for uh, Rick Dove offers up prayers of thanks for all the wonder that nature shares with us. I think that's an appropriate one because just as I went down to read that, there was some movement in the corner of my eye, and Church will be glad to know that the skink is still here. Um, just went crawling across the floor as if it was there timed for your prayer. So prayer for all the joy of of um, of everything coming in. God in your grace, hear our prayers. Um, of Chris offers up prayers for people who are trying to figure out direction and steps in their lives. Chris, we pray with you and we pray for all, with all of those who are, are seeking that same guidance. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Um, continue uh, a prayer from uh, John for uh, his son Mark selling his house in Denver and moving east. We pray for, um, pray for, that, for that. all that comes into that that's probably heightened by this present moment but also for the opportunities that may be arising here as he moves east. God, in your grace, 
and mercy, house selling is not easy, as I'm sure the realtor on this call could tell us. Here are our prayers. A uh, prayer from uh, Aaron for her friend Eve and her family as they are Florida bound to say farewell to her father. And continuing prayers as well for Andre Hill, who's a friend of this congregation, particularly our Evolve group, um, after adjusting to the loss of his mother and Rob uh, with the passing of his father yesterday. Eve, quite a bit of, or we, Aaron, quite a bit of loss. We pray with you and with all of those families. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers, and we pray for safe travels for Eve and her family as they go to Florida to say farewell to her father. God, in your grace and mercy, hear our prayers. Sandy offers up as well prayers for uh, the states where COVID is spreading. Um, and she has, adds the plea for those who may be in those states to please wear a mask. We in Maryland who uh, are becoming more and more accustomed to them are getting, making them a really good style accessory, and we're happy to model them for all of you. But we, we pray to God for all of those who are dealing with this, for places like Houston where the hospitals are already at 97% capacity. We pray for all of the people, or all of our sisters and brothers around the world and in this country to take seriously what is a serious disease and certainly is calling us to question what we hold up as individual liberties as opposed to the shared community that we must live in together. And uh, we also offer up a prayer, John, for your 45th wedding anniversary. John, we pray with joy uh, for you. Happy anniversary. We could sing it. Maybe, maybe something will happen. But we pray for you, and we pray for much joy for all that that brings to you in your house. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. And then we close this out by knowing that this is the last Sunday in Pride Month. Normally, that's a very big thing for us, and it's been a difficult month to do that together in the ways that we traditionally have. But we give thanks for the ways that God has taught us that love is love, that we are able to share those expressions together, that we are able to love one another in ways and welcome each other in the ways that the space can be used. We are grateful for all of those things and for the hard work that has been done by so many in this church and so many who have, had to, who have learned to be able to see where God is calling them in this way. May we continue to take steps together. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. And so we bring all of these prayers together, prayers of hope, prayers of joy, prayers of loss, prayers of longing, and prayers that we have not spoken. And we bring them together in our prayer for peace, saying, O loving God, spirit of hope and peace, lead us from death to life. Lead us from falsehood to truth. Lead us from despair to hope, from fear to trust. Lead us from hate to love, from war to peace. Let peace fill our hearts, our world, our universe. Peace, peace, peace. peace. Those of you who noticed today's hymn, the tune will be different from the words, so we invite you not to let your eyes dance between the notes. Oh, yeah.
Church, it is indeed good to be with you on this Sunday morning, or whenever it is that you're checking into this, this podcast, live stream video, or whatever it's called. But it's good to be here to worship God, to share in a message of hope, to be able to be called up, but also know that we are equipped to answer the call that God is putting before us. So go forward without fear. May risk not hold your way, or may the fear of loss not stand in your way of being called to do the work which God is calling us to do. For God will be with us. We will be able to do what we are being asked. We will be able to take this work if we have hope, if we take the steps, and if we are willing to trust God. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. We hope to join you at, or hope you'll join us at the coffee hour immediately after the service today. Just press the link at the bottom of the bulletin. It's also in the email.